Hey, hello, how are you doing? Welcome along there. We've got a mug of tea here today, so there might be some slurping. So apologies if uh, that's annoying, but I got a very dry throat the other day when I was doing it. There's the first slurp done we're doing today. War Photographer by Carol Ann Duffy, which is uh, a modern poem. It's one from the uh, one of the more modern poems. The, the, the poetry anthology is broken down into two kinds of poems, really. Um, the modern ones, which are the ones that you probably find a little bit easier, and then the traditional ones, they call them. Which, for all intents and purposes, to you means old, the older ones. Caroline Duffy, though, is a modern poet. She was poet Lorette. And until very recently, 2019. Uh, she's a Scottish poet. She was born in Glasgow. She went to university in Liverpool. Um, she's famous for a number of reasons, not least her amazing poetry. But uh, when she was made poet Lorette, um, 2000, maybe, I want to say 2004, something along those lines, I guess. Uh, she was the very first woman to be poet laureate. She was also the first um, woman from the LGBT community to be made poet laureate. So uh, very much a trendsetter in that regard. She wrote this poem, War Photographer, um, about a friend of hers who was literally uh, a war photographer, a journalist who went out and reported on all of the civil wars and, I don't know, land-grabbing conflicts and religious and ideological warfare going on in the world. And so these people go out and they report back. We see them on the evening news. You can see a reporter here. Uh, these two people are wearing, you can see, vests to kind of protect themselves. So uh, the press uh, can go into any conflict area and uh, they have a right to report that um, so they they won't get tangled up in the conflict which is why you see them on the news wearing vests like this uh, to uh, separate them out from uh, people who are actually involved in the warfare so they don't get shot essentially in the modern context so Caroline Duffy uh, she wrote this poem it's a war poem it's about war it's about different kinds of war but it looks through the perspectives through the eyes of uh, pretty much this camera here, uh, a war photographer who's going out there to record all these instances of war. When she was made poet Lorette, uh, Carol Ann Duffy asked um, some of her friends, some of her contemporaries to write some poems uh, to do with war. Um, and one of the other poems in the anthology is called Poppies. It was written by a friend of Carol Ann Duffy's. Uh, at that request so you might want to make that link later on right a couple of things you need to know before we start going through this one uh, this is what you call a dark room here so when Caroline Duffy refers to the dark room that the Pope that the war photographer uses she's talking about um, an area a room in a house or a room in a studio where photographers used to develop their photographs so photographs used to be what they call analog uh, they used to come on film, like this, actual film. Uh, this is what you call a spool. That'll also be important later on. So this is a spool of film. And what would happen would be, you would either develop your photos by bringing them into a chemist, like, I don't know, somebody like Boots, and they would have a little dark room like this. And they would get this film, and they would expose it to light. And then the photographs would come through. So these little photographs, uh, they might they just look like this, as you can see there. And then through the exposure to light, maybe you start to see that person come to life there. Um, so this is the dark room that she talks about. Uh, particularly important now, photographs these days are digital. So they work with SD cards and that kind of thing. Uh, so this is a digital camera here. Um, in the modern context, we don't have dark rooms. So we can take this either two ways. This poem has either um, been written in a contemporary period where they were using analog film, or the dark room that she refers to could be metaphorical. So it could be a metaphorical dark room. 
you know what I mean by that when we get through the poem. So what happens is, the speaker of our poem, the narrator, is going to be a war photographer, our speaker, and they are going around taking lots of photographs of all of these horrible things happening. And their job is to then go back home and uh, report this to uh, mainstream media at home in the UK. And they make a living by selling their photographs to these media outlets. Now, I've picked a couple of photographs to kind of convey the, the violence that these people might see. This is a very famous uh, war fo uh, photo. Uh, this was from the Vietnam conflict where uh, the US was at war with Vietnam. Uh, very famously because uh, this was used to show uh, the US's use of a, a weapon called napalm for the first time. And you can see the US soldiers here and uh, these Vietnamese children running away from a village that's just been bombed. Uh, over here we've got uh, a photo from World War II uh, with the Blitz in London. And you can see, I zoom in there. You can see this young child surrounded by the debris that used to be her home and she's nursing a, a doll. So the impact particularly on children of war is something I'd like you to have in your head. This one is much more recent. Hopefully you may have seen this on the news or in the newspaper. So a war photographer a journalist took this photograph of a young boy. This was in Aleppo. And that's hugely important, but it might give you a little bit of context when some of the some of the places that Duffy mentions in the poem. And he's covered in essentially the same thing that happens here with the Blitz. Lots of bombs falling, lots of shells. And he's covered in, he's, he's got a nasty graze on his head and he's covered in the dust created by the debris that falls. Um, when a, a, a town or a city is being hailed from above with shells. So what happens in this poem is very simple. The war photographer uh, explains his or her feelings about uh, coming back to England to sell these photographs uh, and notes the difference between England and the war zones that they have come from. Okay. Oh. Here we go. All right, a couple of themes to discuss. Uh, one of the famous lines from this particular poem is, he has a job to do. Uh, which is a nice kind of overarching idea because it, it deals with uh, the sense of duty. There's a little bit of a controversial poem in that. We have to decide whether he should take the photos or not take the photos. If he's taking the photos, it's because he is reporting uh, all of these horrible things happening. And it's our right to know. We should know what's going on in the world. Or maybe he shouldn't take the photos because the suffering of this little kid here or this little girl here or these Vietnamese children um, could maybe glorify war in a way. Or maybe um, his responsibility should be to help those people rather than take photographs and not intervene. So if he's not taking them, there's a kind of a, a moral question. And this is a very difficult question, this, this one. Uh, should he get involved? Should he not get involved? That kind of thing. Obviously, oh, the poem is to do with war. It's explicitly mentioned in the title, isn't it? So it's a war photographer. So you can talk about the conflict that you would see. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the types of conflict, but there's different ways or different reasons that people can be at war. People usually land, or argue over land or resources. It can be a political conflict. It can be an ideological conflict. Uh, it could be religious. It could be... There are millions and millions of reasons that people go to war um, seemingly very easily. Yeah, well, the, the world is constantly in a state of war. Some two countries are always, will always and have always been fighting. Uh, I've put this image down to kind of convey that. Uh, the poem deals with sensitivity as well, and particularly desensitivity.
because we see images like this on the news and all over the internet all the time, what happens is, and particularly because we watch violence all the time in our our drama programs and our fiction, and we can become desensitized to it. Um, so if you think I don't know about you using your, I don't know, maybe you've got sensitive teeth like myself, you, and you might use that all the time, and you, you forget about that sensitivity to violence. So it, it feels like hyper real, or it doesn't feel real to you. And then the other thing I'd like you to think about is the compassion. So the idea to, to feel along with somebody uh, is a theme that carries throughout this poem as we decide whether this person should take the photographs or they should not take the photographs. And then our compassion and our desensitization, if you like, to these images that we see. All right, we'll do our ideas. We'll do our language structure form, our analysis, if you like, and we'll do our context like this. This seems to be your preferred way to do it. Here we go. I'll read through it once uh, to begin. Uh, I think that makes it a little bit easier. Right, let's remember, we've got the point of view, the perspective of a photographer And they are being discussed in the third person. Okay, so it's focalized. If you want to use the fancy AO2 term. So we have it focalized from the point of view of the photographer, but it is in the third person in his dark room. He is finally alone. Okay, so we've got the third person narration going on. All right, and it goes like this. In his dark room, he is finally alone, with spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. The only light is red and softly glows, as though this were a church, and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. Belfast, Beirut, Bum Fen, all flesh is grass. He has a job to do. Solutions slop in trays beneath his hands, which did not tremble then, though seem to now. Rural England, home again, to ordinary pain which simple weather can dispel, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. Something is happening. The stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes, a half-formed ghost. He remembers the cries of this man's wife, how he sought approval, without words, to do what someone must, and how the blood stained into foreign dust. A hundred agonies in black and white, from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday's supplement. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. From the aeroplane he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. Okay, one structural thing to notice before we do anything else is it is in stanzas of six lines. And you will notice that the rhyme scheme is that each six line stanza has a couplet at the end. So the last two lines tend to rhyme. I'll prove it to you. Feet and heat, must and dust, and wear and care. You didn't believe, you fools. Here we go, right. So it's got a consistent rhyme scheme. And here's what's going on. In his dark room, he is finally alone. All right, now we can decide whether that is a metaphorical dark room, i.e. this could be his depression, his anxiety, or it could be literally an actual dark room where he's developing photos. I have the feeling that it's a, I quite like the idea that it's a literal dark room. He is finally alone. The adverb finally here um, shows that he's spent quite a lot of time in a war zone. He's back from a war zone. So a war zone is loud. Uh, there's lots of uh, people. There's chaos. So maybe this dark room is a, a little bit of a reprieve. Can he relax a little bit, even though what he's doing is uh, very painful in itself. 
uh, and he has with him spools of suffering set out in ordered rows. Right, you've got the siblings here, but that's not particularly what I'm interested in. I'm much more interested in what we call here transferred epithet, which is a form of a metaphor. Okay, so it's metaphorical. I'll explain what I mean by that. He has spools of suffering. So let's go back up here. These are the spools that we talked about earlier on. And he's taken all of his film out of his camera and he's got them lined up. Okay, so he's got all of these spools lined up, ready to go. And he's going to transfer these into photographs. Okay, so they're ready to go. Now, it's not actually these spools. They cannot suffer, okay? So it's, it's like they have been made human. Uh, they aren't suffering. It is the people within the photographs that are suffering. So the, the suffering has been transferred from the people to the spools. They are described as having the suffering. That's why you call it transferred at That's fancy, but you can just say it's metaphorical. You get away with saying that's personification there, if you like, either. It doesn't matter. The main thing is that the... The image, the idea that it's not actually the spools that are suffering. It is the people that he has taken the photographs of. And they're in order rows. You can say something about this if you like. To me, it's like he's uh, he's got some military precision here when he's laying out his his order rows of spoons. It's almost like they're soldiers, if you like. In a battalion or what have you. The only light is red and softly glows, okay, again. Everything's very gentle, everything's very um, relaxed. It seems to be a little bit of a reprieve or a relaxation, aware from the, the pain of the, the front lines. The only light is red. Remember, it's very dark in here. Uh, you can do that redness with its connotations of blood and all the rest, if you like. To me, that's a little bit simplistic. I would focus maybe instead on uh, the idea of his concentration and getting this correct. There's a lot at stake here if he messes up these photographs. The only light is red and softly glows as though this were a church and he a priest preparing to intone a mass. Okay, so there's a comparison here. It is metaphorical. So he is like, he's essentially like a priest here. This is a religious ceremony for him. There's where you can talk about it being a simile, as though this were a church and he, a priest, preparing to intone a mass. Intone here is your verb with its lovely connotations of uh, reciting a prayer. So he's going to say a mass. Look, we've got the non-standard capitalization of mass there as well, which is interesting. Makes it feel like it's very, very important to him. So this whole process is very, very important. He has to get it right. And he's doing it in a very slow, deliberate, and measured way. Okay? Then Duffy uses, this is really interesting, She uses, let's get rid of the ball there so it doesn't annoy you. These are cities and they are uh, from war zones essentially. I'll explain where now in a minute. So it's a list here. Woo! Blitz. It's a list. And not only that, these are minor sentences, okay? So Beirut one word it's a minor sentence it doesn't contain a verb so it's a minor sentence but she uses essentially full stops for what could be or should be commas she is listing um all of these um war zones right let me tell you something about these war zones then what's interesting to me is that all of these war zones these are capital cities of areas that have been um in conflict. We've got Ireland here, Belfast is in Ireland. We've got Lebanon and we've got Vietnam. 
Now, I've already shown you the photograph of the Vietnamese conflict here. So that's the kind of thing that we saw in Vietnam. The second one, uh, Belfast, I don't have a photograph of that, but I do have a photograph of um, Beirut, or somewhere similar to Beirut. This was taken in Syria and Aleppo, which is right next door. Syria and Lebanon are right next door. Beirut is the capital of Lebanon. So all of these conflicts, what's interesting to me is that all of these conflicts are what you call ideological conflicts. They're fighting about uh, ideas. So in Ireland, this was a civil war. Uh, Lebanon, that was Israel and Lebanon uh, getting into um, all sorts of ideological conflict. Uh, Vietnam was the US versus Vietnam. So Lebanon and Israel, uh, the US versus Vietnam. These are all ideological conflicts. For example, the US uh, what is, is and was a capitalist country and it was fighting Vietnam. It's a bit of a proxy war. I won't get into the, uh, the complexity of that just now, but this was kind of, I don't know, communism and capitalism. What's interesting about that for us is uh, the power of ideas. talking about power and conflict all the time it's these ideas that are driving people to war to to the speaker of the poem it, it seems that those are foolish reasons to go to war and they make this very clear when they say all flesh is grass this is a biblical illusion really it's not an illusion because it's a, it's a direct quotation from the book of Isaiah and um, which is the Old Testament. It uh, appears in Hebrew Bible as well, book 40, if you want to have a look. So, uh, all flesh is grass. This means something very, very simple. The boy over here for this. It means that uh, life is impermanent. That we uh, will all die. We will all die. We will all turn to grass again um, after a period of time. So it's almost like a devaluing of human life that the poet is getting at here. Uh, this, to me, he has a job to do, is the central debate of the poem. It's kind of the poem in microcosm. Either he should be doing it, or don't do. He can't get emotional. He can't afford to get emotional. If he cried every time he saw something horrible, then he wouldn't be able to do his job. He has a job to do. And uh, this seems to me, I don't know, the, the poem in microcosm, if you want to be fancy, why not? Let's try it. So if I was to, you, come up with a line that tells the message of this poem I'll go for. He has a job to do. Lovely tea. Right. Solution slap. We've got the sibilance there. In trays. Let me explain what that is. So you'd have a tray. It would be filled with a solution of chemicals. You would get your film. You take your film. You put it into the tray of solution. And then when it comes back out, uh, the photograph has developed. All right. So solution slap in trays. That just means the, the chemicals. Really, that should be green, shouldn't it, for your context. Beneath his hands, which did not tremble then. I quite like this one, uh, as if we're still thinking about him as a priest. Uh, you could say something maybe about the idea of him blessing. Uh, or this ceremony going on. Up to you. Which did not tremble then, this is most interesting to me. Which did not tremble then, though seen to now, right? A little bit of AO2, so then and now. Then is the past, now is the present. So it seems like tense is getting messed with a little bit. And he talks about, she talks about this verb to tremble, 
that he now feels. So he is trembling now, but he didn't tremble in the past. To me, that's quite simple. So he saw uh, horrible things. So he saw death and he didn't tremble. Now, when he has time to remember it, uh, he trembles. Okay, so it seems to me that this, this person is clearly suffering from some sort of uh, post trauma. He is trembling now in the in the moment where he's had time to process what's happened to him. Um, you can do something with this PTSD as a little bit of context if you like. She did commission some work, Caroline Duffy, um, on war from very from fellow poets, um, which dealt heavily with those kind of ideas. We'll deal with it again in Poppies from Jane Weir, uh, which deals with a very similar idea. Again, she uses a minor sentence, rural England. So you get this minor sentence, which changes everything. Uh, to me, this is kind of like a, a caesura in the poem. Almost a little pause there, or a volta. There's a change, okay? So the setting changes. At this, at this moment in the poem, it's almost like the setting has changed. So he was in the war zone. He was here and saw death, but he's now back in England. He's in England now. He's back in his little studio. Home again to ordinary pain, which simple weather can dispel, to fields which don't explode beneath the feet. I could talk a little bit about the, the end focus of some of these lines and the continuous enjambment. But it's ongoing, so you can talk about that anywhere. If you can find some sort of line to talk about the emphasis that Duffy places on a particular word, um, I would go for it. To me, the spell here means to get rid of. So it's a nice one to focus on. So uh, very similar to remains. I would I would make a, a link here to remains. Uh, the line from Simon Armitage's poem, where the speaker says, and the drink and the drugs can't flush it out. Uh, here, the poet is saying, simple weather can dispel uh, ordinary pain that people feel. So the poet makes a clear distinction between the kind of pain that every day happens to people in England. So everyday complaints, I don't know. What I like to call these then, uh, for for our purposes, is first world problems. Uh, I don't know. The internet is down. Can you imagine the pain? Um, ordinary pain, which the weather can't dispel. So uh, maybe if the weather picks up, it puts you in a better mood. Instead, the the unordinary pain, if you like, the extraordinary. The extraordinary pain is when fields explode beneath the feet of running children. So these are mines or explosions or traps that literally explode beneath the feet of running children. Uh, the preposition here shows how close they are to the, the children are at risk. So these poor children that you see up here can't even play in the street because um, it could explode from beneath them. Okay. Uh, nightmare heat as well there, obviously. We can say something about how um, they are suffering physically as well. So they're suffering physically as well as psychologically. Right, we've got a little bit of action occurring here. Something is happening. There seems to be a little bit of media res there, if you like. And um, this something is happening. This something 
is the firm of develop, developing. Okay, so the film starts to develop uh, and we, we get a blow-by-blow blow account of what happens. The stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes. Okay. The stranger is important because these people are anonymous. A um, little bit of context. He probably doesn't speak the same language. He can't communicate, so we probably have him do it through hand signals when he's out there taking photographs and that kind of thing. Uh, communication is a real problem. And that will be highlighted later on when he's unable to ask for permission because he can't communicate with the people. So a stranger's feature is somebody he's, whose photo he took, who he doesn't know, they're nameless to him, faintly start to twist before his eyes. Right, you got the adverb there. Faintly, so can't make it out, almost like a half-formed ghost, and that's the metaphor. So the idea being, there could be a literal ghost now, i.e. they could be dead, um, or the idea that these people are haunting him uh, through PTSD. So it faintly starts to twist before his eyes, the verb twist there. You can take the connotations from that if you like. You can say it twisted. It can often be an adjective to describe something that's horrible to you. Um, here, it happens very, very slowly. Um, the light um, develops the picture quite slowly. So it happens, I don't know, maybe you've got a, like a Polaroid camera, you can buy them now see it develop very very slowly so a half one ghost and then because he starts to see this person he remembers the cries of this man's wife so this is the memory of the moment he's thinking back now to what happened when he was taking that photograph remember he's taken hundreds and hundreds of these of these photographs so trying to remember individual cases might be difficult and he remembers how he sought approval, the verb to seek. He sought, sought is the past tense of seek, which means to ask. He asked approval without any words. You can talk about the elite there if you like. To emphasize the fact that he cannot communicate So he has to ask uh, non-verbally. He has to say, can I take this photograph? Is it okay to take a photograph of this dead man? Um, and he's asking the man's wife. Um, and he can't really do it, so he has to just take the photograph anyway and plead with his eyes as if to say, is it okay if I document? So the idea being, does he document it? or not um, it's a moral dilemma but he says somebody must and I'll underline that with the red as well because this is a modal verb he thinks it is, it is his moral prerogative to he has to he has to take these photographs somebody has got to get this out into the world people must know what's happening Without words to do what somebody must and how the blood stain into foreign dust. You get the verb here again. I would draw a little parallel here again to remains. So we've got the, uh, if I use the line from remains, Simon Armitage says that the, he had a blood shadow that remained on the street here. Uh, the blood stained into foreign dust. And someone must do something to get this shadow from the foreign dust into uh, the minds of the reader. So he considers it his duty to report that these people are dying in, in these sandy climates. 
A uh, hundred agonies in black and white. So these photographs that he's taken are black and white. They could be literally black and white, or they could be metaphorically black and white in that they are, I don't know, sepia coloured. Uh, maybe it conveys some sort of sadness. To me here, he takes lots of photographs. Now remember, they're all nameless. So it could be anyone. Uh, the sad thing is that even though he's taken hundreds and hundreds of agonies, now obviously we've got this connotation here, the pain, the severe pain. So the severe suffering of these people and here his editor is made to sound quite cold so the editor this is the person in charge of the newspaper uh, his editor is going to pick out five or six the verb pick here is interesting because he's going to select five or six for sunday supplement he's, it's almost like he's saying some are good some are bad Almost like he wants the very best ones. How can you have a bad photo of some being, somebody being killed or somebody being shot? So it seems fairly inhumane. Or lacking compassion. Of course, the editor would say as well, somebody must, somebody has to take the best photos from these to know which one will have the, the biggest impact. For example, somebody picked this photo, an editor would have decided, yes, this is the photo. This is a powerful enough photo to convey the message um, that uh, these people should not be being bombed. Um, you might remember a couple of years ago, um, another photo emerged of a, a very young boy dead on a beach, that the, the immigrant crisis that was happening in that one went around the world very, very quickly. So it is an important job to pick out five or six. He wants ones that are gonna have an impact. But in a way that he wants them to have an impact so that he can sell papers. So you have to ask yourself about the morality there. Complex ideas in this poem. All right, a little bit of context here. The Sunday supplement. Uh, usually the the paper on a Sunday has a special edition maybe a glossy magazine uh, the connotations here are that this is for entertainment the Sunday supplement is usually for entertainment. It's, you've got a little bit more time to read the paper on a Sunday. So people go out into their gardens, they stretch out, they read all about what films are out, what TV's coming up, what theatre they might want to go and see. And maybe they spend some time reading all about this conflict that's going on in a foreign land. He says the reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and pre-launch beers. Uh, the, the rhyming here, prick with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers, tears, beers. So we've got a rhyme scheme outside the ordinary six line uh, with the couplet at the end. So really for emphasis here. Um, the reader's eyeballs are pricked with tears between the bath and pre-lunch beers. So here's what they're doing. Uh, they're getting up in the morning and uh, they're going to read the paper. Oh, they're going to have a bath, read the paper, and then they're going to go and have some beers. Uh, this is relaxing, this is relaxing. This can be relaxing, but obviously uh, in the context that we, we see it, it shouldn't be relaxing. So this is an entertainment uh, for these people. And they are feeling grief. They do feel compassion. But the speaker seems to suggest that not enough. It's very much entertainment. 
they might cry. Uh, isn't that terrible? I can't believe that's happening. Oh, it's just awful. But there is almost a passivity in it. There's no action. Uh, maybe they they might do so much as donate to a, a charity, but that might be as, as good as it gets. Nothing's changing the conflict that's happening in these nations. So the reader's eyeballs prick with tears. They do have some compassion, uh, some sort of sympathy or empathy. But they can't understand it because they have never been there. So the, the war photographer feels isolated and alone with his PTSD, with his understanding of the pain that these people feel. And then he has to go back, he has to go back. So from the airplane, so he goes back. So he heads back to the war zone. Impassively is his adverb that he uses here. He stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. The stares is a verb as well, obviously. Passively, um, to be passive means to not do anything. So he is the opposite of passive. He is active. He is doing something. He is trying to improve the situation. And he is disgusted. public ap apathy. He says, from the air, or the speaker says, from the airplane, he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. So he's uh, in a bit of a dilemma. He's asking himself, am I making a difference? Or What's the point? Every time he goes out to these war zones, uh, he takes photographs of people that are dying and the public, the public apathy uh, is a point of anger for, for him. So this is very much an anti-war poem an anti-public uh, apathy. Um, let's say ignorance. Okay. So a lot in there. Um, I think it's um, a more simplistic poem than some of the other ones. Obviously there's huge hidden depths here. Um, but just looking at the narration from start to end, quite easy to follow, I think, this one. Uh, if it was me and I was making some, some comparisons I would talk about remains uh, with the suffering and the PTSD and um, both of this, the speakers seem to suffer quite badly or both of the subjects of the poem should I say suffer quite badly um, from what they perceive to be either guilt or feelings of, I don't know, inability or uh, impotence to affect their situation. Uh, what I might also go for is any of the war poems really are going to work very well with this one. So bayonet charge, uh, charge of light brigade. Charge of light brigade is very pro-war, uh, so it could go up against this one. As a, as a kind of a versus poem. So you could say, well, this one is very anti-war, look at the suffering it causes, but Charge of the Light Brigade uh, is somewhat of a glorification. Uh, Bayonet Charge, you can talk about uh, modern warfare versus um, traditional World War One warfare. Traditional, I make it sound like it. Uh, it's changed over time for a good reason. Uh, not the case, um, but there are other, so you can talk about psychological, 
so in my last duchess uh, the power that the the duke has over the duchess for example here the power that these uh, photograph people have over the photographer. Okay, loads you can do. I don't want to get into too many comparisons there. I'll be here all day and you've watched enough already and listened to me. Okay, all right, thanks guys. What I'll do is I'll post up the, the accompanying PowerPoint with all of these annotations on it so you can do whatever you like with them. Hopefully you found it useful and I'll see you next time.